Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, greetings from Europe. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this conference. Uh, it's my first time, um, uh, but I hope that not last time when I'm invited by Indian Pharmaceutical Alliance to um, be present at your event. Um, um, I would, uh, for, for, I'm um, representing uh, the European Association um, Generic Biosimilars and Medicine and uh, Value Added Medicines, but I'm also uh, very active in the international arena, uh, uh, in the regulatory affairs field, uh, mainly through the IGBA, so our, our international uh, generic and biosimilar associations, uh, representing um, you, in fact, representing our industry in the ICH, in the management committee, together with uh, Nick Cappuccino from Dr. Reddy. So I guess uh, a well-known person for a lot of uh, people in this audience. Um, so my, um, my, my talk and my, um, my view will be very much also driven by this international dimension and uh, indeed um, our engagement in, uh, in ICH. Um, Looking at the uh, coming from the association, and um, uh, obviously um, our main focus is to look at the regulatory affairs from the policy um, uh, perspective and also advocacy perspective. So basically, our role is to be in, uh, in in touch with our members and understand how we can help them, how we can help you, in fact, in shaping the regulatory environment which fits uh, your um, your um, your needs uh, and also needs to develop uh, new, um, new new generic new biosimilar medicines to manufacture to respond really to uh, to your needs um, uh, and from the trade association perspective obviously we try to focus and try to pick up those parts which are the most important for you um, and which can really make a difference uh, in sense of your daily operation and daily um, work. So if I can uh, ask for the first slide, please. So uh, for this uh, particular purpose, um, for purpose of this uh, conference, I picked up one <coughs> fundamental um, element from the uh, global perspective. It's really um, need for um, urgent need for for the network uh, for the regulatory framework which support a true global development uh, for generics, complex generics, and biosimilar medicines. Next one, please. Next slide, please. So, um, looking at the picture um, uh, where we are in 2021 um, from this perspective. Next one, please. I think we are still um, um, uh, far from ideal situation and global development and global filing is a pretty uh, bumpy road. Next one, please. Um, but I'm, a I'm not a pessimist person, I'm rather optimist, so I'm trying to look um, at the bright side first um, and to see that uh, clearly um, recently we can talk about a certain progress in, uh, in harmonization and that especially um, looking at uh, latest development in the ICH arena, I will, um, uh, this, I will talk about it um, um, later on. Um, and also, um, I think it's very important to look what now is happening also in WHO, especially um, regarding the discussion on uh, future reliance. That's the bright side of the, of the picture. But there is also, um, unfortunately, not sufficient progress, uh, in my opinion, uh, in view of um, uh, discussion on global comparator for bioequivalence and clinical studies. There is still much, still too much duplication, efficiency, and fragmentations in the development and filing, uh, which we will clearly discuss uh, later on uh, and will be probably raised in details by uh, other speakers. Right, please. Um, I think that uh, from the policy perspective, uh, 
I think we uh, global development is a must. Um, I think we cannot afford anymore uh, developing products in a, such a fragmented way as is, as is happening now. Um, and there are various reasons and also um, various arguments which should resonate in uh, decision makers. Uh, first of all, and I think the most important is really the um, issue of the access to medicines. Um, clearly, global development uh, and current uh, global standards will facilitate access to medicines in um, in uh, and in, in in various jurisdictions. So I think that gives more flexibility in sense of access in the choice of treatment. And that will be really the driver for the decision makers to uh, to go for it, even for this only for this reason. Obviously, from our perspective, um, there is an important part which is related to regulatory efficiency, um, especially a reduction of time uh, uh, and uh, removing barriers to market, um, no duplication of of studies. Um, uh, and clearly a more and more direction towards uh, regulatory convergence, um, which leads to another important element in the whole picture is the sustainability um, of the industry, but also of the healthcare systems, because actually um, uh, all generics, biosimilars, medicines are uh, contributing enormously to sustainability of the industry. And last but uh, to the healthcare systems and uh, not, and last but not least, also, the ethical aspects of uh, studies, um, we should at any price avoid repetition of unnecessary and ethical clinical studies and unnecessary exposure uh, patients or volunteers to risk. So I think there is enough uh, reasons to really move towards the global development also in off-patent sector equally as it happens in the on-patent sector. Next one, please. Yes, and to achieve it, um, it's very clear that we need to develop uh, three paths um, in parallel. One, to look at the legal framework. The second, to look at the criteria for acceptance of the global comparator. And the third one, on harmonization of standards, including, for example, harmonization of bioequivalents. Next one, please. And it is very clear that um, uh, the legal framework seems to be um, one of the most difficult, um, simply because uh, there is no one tool uh, for global harmonization of the legal framework. It's clearly outside of the scope of the ICH, and it is really individual countries' decision on its legal framework um, and acceptance on foreign comparator. So. Um, we, we really need, it needs to be a political um, decision and political will to move in this direction. Next slide, please. Um, and it's not only my opinion. I clearly, I want to quote um, um, uh, WHO and uh, Luther Gaza, Gwazak, who said that um, in, in, in its publication, that it's really inefficient to harmonize only the requirements for performing bioequivalent studies. Uh, if such study uh, has to be repeated uh, for every single country simply because of different comparator products. So um, it seems that um, developing only uh, common standards will not really facilitate uh, the global development um, per se. The next one, please. Um, as you know, the current, pic in current picture, there are still um, individual countries' uh, requirements. Uh, um, there is um, uh, clearly uh, European, uh, um, there are European requirements, uh, FDA um, referenced uh, listed drugs in WHO. There is also um, a list of um, a global reference products. So as you see, uh, as, as you know very well, it's very fragmented. Next one. Next one, please. But there's a bit of light in the tunnel, and this is what I wanted to highlight as a, as a really um, yeah, way forward and, and something to watch very closely. Um, and I, again, quote um, a publication uh, but Alfredo Garcia Arieta, uh, you see um, on the sc screen, uh, on the slide, um, 
um, the reference to this publication, and it's really worth to look at this because it shows that in some countries um, there is already progress, like Australia, Canada, New Zealand, Singapore, South Africa, Switzerland, Taiwan, or WHO, uh, where um, there is an um, opportunity to use a foreign comparator for studies, obviously under certain conditions. And the devil, it, devil is it's usually in details, so um, you need to look at those very closely but um, as I said, there is a bit of light in the tunnel, and I hope that we will um, that the number of those um, red uh, boxes will increase over time. Next one, please. Um, and very interesting development also in the UK uh, from 1st January 2021. Um, as you know, uh, UK left the European Union and is now in the position of shaping its own regulatory framework, um, including also um, the interpretation and its position towards a uh, foreign comparator. Um, I, well, I, I would recommend you to uh, look at the guideline which uh, was recently published by um, um, the UK, um, indeed, which conditions need to be meet, met to um, use the global the, the foreign comparator for a bioequivalence or therapeutic equivalence studies. Next one, please. Um, yes, so we um, let's say that we have uh, uh, basically the legal framework um, uh, allowing this, but I think this is the one of the very critical point is also also to look at the criti criteria for acceptance of the global comparator. and. And that's a challenge for a moment because you have actually it is uh, in very in all countries uh, cases almost um, it's up to the applicant um, to prove um, that uh, we can talk about comparable products and um, the whole discussion uh, next years will be probably how to prove and how to use scientific data and analytical tools. Uh, to provide this evidence that the reference product from one region is comparable, is similar to the, uh, compar to the comparator uh, sourced from um, another region. Um, one of the interesting uh, concepts could be that uh, actually if you see that um, the, the product, um, the reference product uh, comparator was um, um, developed based on the same clinical um, package, uh, and authorized in uh, in various jurisdictions. Well, theoretically, we could say, okay, that's a quite high um, a chance that we talk about the same comparator. But as I said, for a moment, it's still very much um, a burden of proof is on the applicant, and um, and that's a, that's a, that's a challenge. Um, simply because uh, for the regulators. Um, it's not always possible to exchange the information for the reason of confidentiality or legal restrictions. So that's uh, also something that probably um, needs to be in the future, maybe in a more efficient way, how under the confidentiality uh, conditions, obviously, to exchange better the information between regulators. Next slide, next, please. Next slide, please. Yes, um, now I want to look a bit on the um, on the recent developments in ICH. Uh, as I said, it's a bit of the light in the tunnel also on this side because um, there, are, there is a more and more discussion uh, on guidelines and harmonization of guidelines which affect us and help us to move towards the global development. Uh, I want to mention only M9 and M10. Um, it means classification uh, uh, system based bio waivers um, already adopted uh, and also uh, ongoing work on biotical method validations um, and um, important work which is still ongoing but clearly watch this space because uh, it's ongoing work on bioequivalence for immediate re so release solid dosage form uh, which covers study design and data analytics in the first stage but also, um, there is a plan to go to more advanced bioequivalence studies design topics. Um, and last but not least, extremely important uh, place uh, is the generic discussion group, um, which was created um, um, some time ago to map future needs for harmonizations, including 
modified release, long-acting injectables, inhalations, transdermal forms. It does not mean that those topics will be immediately subject of harmonization, but there is a lot of work done to um, move towards this in the future and identify where the priorities are and which area needs to be harmonized. Next one, please. Um, so I think that um, going close to the end of my presentation, I think that uh, we all know uh, the opportunities which are associated with this global development, um, especially um, for generics and complex generics. And I don't even mention biosimilars because it's it's very it's very obvious that um, if we if we manage to um, somehow aggregate um, developments across regions, uh, it will really um, help to build the, the economic uh, economically viable case and uh, go for this development. Uh, in the current situation, when it's still very fragmented, obviously there is no that much a uh, driver to develop products for smaller markets, small populations. So that should be really an opportunity. Um, also, um, uh, clearly uh, developing uh, or working on common standards, um, for example, on bioequivalence studies, it increase um, obviously the efficiency in generic drug development, but we should not, un uh, should not um, uh, forget that it also will lead to increase the quality of generic drug development, which basically is the big interest of patients uh, and uh, to, the, to provide them with high quality uh, drugs. Um, next slide, please. And just to conclude, I think this is really the list of things for the associations to work on, um, because clearly uh, we need um, urgently one, uh, I mean, the, the favorable framework to move towards global development of generic, complex generic and biosimilars, tackle all these three pillars at the same time, scientific, legal and regulatory aspects, um, we need to translate um, this concept of global comparator into regulatory science to discuss which criteria will be appropriate to um, accept the uh, uh, foreign comparator. Um, then uh, there is also a part of on authorities to work closer uh, on uh, uh, similar assessment, similar way of assessing products uh, in assessment reports. Um, and also, uh, I think that to learn from the WHO experience, especially in the pre-qualification process, how uh, indeed uh, we can uh, um, um, come to the much, uh, much more streamlined uh, development uh, uh, program. Um, and not, uh, not forget also about one important international arena, which is IPRP, where the more the regulators can uh, indeed discuss those uh, common elements of assessment. Um, um, I think that one weakness we clearly needs to be uh, tackled is the possibility to share certain information uh, among regulators under um, confidentiality and secrecy, secrecy agreements. For a moment, we still see a lot of hurdles on this. Um, and, uh, and then we should not forget that maybe certain um, intern digital tools like, um, for example, identification of the medicinal products uh, like ISO IDMP standards will help us in the future to, um, uh, to identify whether the products, uh, reference comparator products are really the same uh, or not. Um, next slide, please. Um, so um, I'm coming to the end of my presentations, and I, as I said, um, uh, it's still a long way to go. But being an optimist pe person, um, I, I, as I said, uh, uh, let's work together to make it happen one day. And I hope sooner than later. And I wish all of us uh, indeed to uh, be able to. Um, have one day the global development of our products. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Good day um, from Washington, D.C., in my case. 
very happy to be here and we appreciate um, the opportunity to participate in the um, webinar conference today. Um, I would like to use um, a few minutes of my time today to talk about how um, standards and science-based guidance can support regulator priorities and industry needs around the world and specifically talk about some of the work that USP has undertaken in a few priority areas. Uh, next slide, please. Um, very, very quickly, um, just an overview of, of who, who we are at uh, the United States Pharmacopeia, known as USP. We are, um, last year, we were 200 years old, 201 now, um, and we are a global nonprofit organization, and we're unique in that we are the only pharmacopoeia in the world who is not part of a government agency. That being said, we work very closely with the US FDA and um, regulatory organizations from around the world. And, um, you know, partially by way of our independent status, we're while we, we um, undertake all of the functions of a um, pharmacopoeia, we also have some other um, programs and functions that are a little bit unique um, in, in this space. So our mission is to advance public health through, through standards and related programs. Um, we have our main laboratories in the United States, but also in India, um, in Hyderabad, where um, we have close to 300 staff working and offices in eight countries. Um, importantly, the standards that we develop are set by um, over 800 scientists and experts who volunteer their time on our committees and over 100 US FDA liaisons who participate in those committees. Um, our committees are very international as well with um, a number of members from India and many other countries around the world. We're governed by a convention, um, which is comprised of 500 organizations from the health and science community. Um, we, eight, eight of our convention members are from India. Um, the convention is where we take direction on the work that we do on our overall strategy and approach, and it's the organization and the body to which we're accountable. Um, the USP South Asia chapter, as I said, includes eight members, and we're delighted that Professor V. Suresh serves as the chair of the uh, South Asia chapter. Next slide, please. So um, I wanted to take a few minutes to talk about four priority areas. Um, Nitro, which include nitrosamines, um, supply chain resilience very broadly, um, COVID-19 vaccine development and delivery, and um, in assuring the quality of COVID-19 treatments. Next slide, please. So there are, actually this slide says five areas, my mistake is four areas um, that we wanted to sort of um, mention as ways and tools that we deploy to support regulators and industry around the world. The first, it's probably pretty obvious, is um, developing um, science-based public quality standards, um, of which we have about um, 5,000 today. Um, the second is toolkits and guidance. And these are, um, these are science-based um, resources that are available that we're able to put together quickly, but with the guidance of our expert committees and the, um, the input from the US FDA and other regulatory agencies. And these are intended to respond quickly to urgent, um, urgent issues. And we'll talk about those in a few moments. Technical support, leveraging our scientific staff and the staff that we um, that work with industry and with, um, with others around the world to help make, um, to help enable them to utilize standards and guidance most effectively. And then what we could broadly call um, convening stakeholders to share best practice and have dialogues about, um, about how to ensure the supply of quality medicines around the world. And I mention this because this is something that we've, um, we've really embraced as a global organization, 
bringing regulators um, and industry from various parts of the world together seeking solutions. Next slide. So priority number one, priority challenge number one that um, I wanted to raise is um, nitrosamine impurities. And this is a, um, a topic, um, uh, you know, I think almost everybody has some familiarity with going back to 2018 when nitrosamines were um, identified in several ARBs used to treat um, high blood pressure and heart failure. Um, following that, um, nitrosamines were found in several other drug products, um, which led to um, significant efforts from regulators and industry around the world to reduce their presence in the, in the drug supply. Um, you know, I think what, what became apparent um, over the, the following months is that because these impurities were, um, were noticed in um, different, uh, different levels in various drug products, you know, I think the a fair conclusion to be drawn is that it's possible that based on uh, manufacturing processes and changes, nitrosamines could be found in a wide variety of products and really um, required a, another look about how we, um, we are addressing, addressing these um, important, significant, um, concerning impurities. So um, part of our response at USP has been to develop a new general chapter. Um, and in general, if you're not familiar, a general chapter provides guidance um, broadly around a, um, a category of medicines and their manufacturing of them, for instance, rather than necessarily around a specific product. So we've developed a general chapter that is now open for um, public comments that um, includes four analytical methods and um, we're developing a uh, method for testing nitrosamines and chemical solvents. And that work is work that's being done very, all of this is being done closely with um, regulators, but the work in chemical solvents in particular, working hard with US FDA on this. Um, the um, general chapter also includes optimized methods for specific um, drug products as well. In addition to that, and maybe I should say supplementary to that, we've developed a suite of six um, reference um, standards that um, can be used for the analysis of nitrosamines. Um, they can be used for methods developed by um, FDA, um, but also other regulators, as well as methods developed by in-house manufacturers. But we think these are um, these reference standards in the general chapter will be an important tool to help get our arms around um, this nitrosamines challenge. Um, we are at the same time also um, working on training initiatives for um, regulators around the world and um, and industry. Um, to start, we've developed eight tutorial videos uh, that discuss the challenges of uh, analytical testing and procedures for nitrosamines quantification, um, utilizing liquid chromatography with high re resolution mass spec, along with other tests and methods. Um, our lab in India is about to begin the development of a test method to, de to detect nitrosamines in rifampin and um, rifapentin, um, which are for the treatment of tuberculosis. So those, those are especially important. And our USP education group is developing a course on the use of the general chapter and associated reference standards. Again, all of this work has been done with multiple um, regula regulatory agencies, some of them noted on this slide. Uh, next slide, please. So the second priority challenge that we wanted to note is on the resilience of the medicine supply chain. This, of course, is um, one of the uber topics of the, um, both the public policy and regulatory policy community around the world right now due to uh, COVID-19. But, you know, I think it's arguable that COVID-19 brought these challenges um, front and center 
Um, many of the challenges existed before, but just weren't as um, acutely obvious, perhaps. Um, you know, th this slide notes some of the, some, not all, of the um, challenges and causes and concerns around supply chain resilience, which I think we all know is a multifaceted, um, multifaceted challenge. Um, you know, that, that presents, um, presents, you know, this as something that uh, may be too mammoth to address. At the same time, though, it also presents opportunities um, along the way to make progress looking at each of these, um, these causes. We prioritize this, as do many governments and regulators around the world, I think because of the big consequences to disruption. You know, disruption in the supply chain for many goods um, is a problem and an inconvenience, but of course, disruption in the supply chain for medicines or medical products has um, consequences on patient care and even their, their lives. So we take it pretty seriously. Um, next slide, please. So some work that we are doing at, at USP is leveraging the data sources that <clears throat> USP has available <coughs> to it through the course of our regular work, but we're also leveraging public data sources into a uh, information data asset to help identify upstream supply chain risks with a goal to, um, to um, make those risks more obvious to regulators and to industry so that mitigation can take place before these upstream risks become a crisis downstream. So I'd like to play a short video that just provides a little bit, a little bit more context to, uh, to this topic. If we could play the video, please. Thank you. Um, if we go to the next slide. Yeah, so um, the, the work on the medicine supply chain is ongoing um, in the um, um, medicine supply map. And we're um, looking forward to building that resource and making it um, available um, to regulators and industry in the coming months. and. You know, I think we also realize that this will take a lot of partnership to um, to grow this um, this resource. But you know, the the fundamental underlying principle here is to um, have an informed, have data evidence um, to inform dialogue about where the supply chain needs um, focus, investment, incentives to be to be strengthened. Um, on on that note. We also wanted to point out some of the work that we're doing 
um, to engage stakeholders <clears throat> in dialogue about, um, about the supply chain. Um, one is a series that we've um, developed um, that's coming out of our India operations called COVID Connect, where we've been bringing together regulators and industry to talk about the um, pressing challenges that have been pre presented in, um, in the regulatory framework um, due to, as a result of COVID. We've also put forward some, um, some policy papers to drive dialogue on, um, on um, better policy and investments on supply chain resilience. The first one outlines some key elements um, to building a more, more resilient supply chain to, with the intent to look, at, to look at this in a more holistic way. You can go to the next slide, please. Another way that we are um, we're, we're working with regulators around the world is through the USP Apex Center of Excellence on Supply Chain Security. Um, this Center of Excellence was um, launched in 2017, and it's been led and led, led and sponsored by the US FDA, and is an an outgrowth of the FDA supply chain security toolkit. Uh, USP is delighted to be working with uh, FDA and APEC and the 21 economies in APEC um, to convene regulators and stakeholders around so far, um, so far um, five areas of the um, 10, 10 um, focus areas of the supply chain toolkit. Um, these have included good manufacturing processes, uh, GDP, internet sales, pharmacy practices, and detecting and screening technologies. So this is, uh, this is one way, I, I wouldn't call this, uh, it's not harmonization, but it is building upon global best practice um, among, among regulators. So we're very happy with this and look forward to um, the expansion of this, of this work going forward and even bringing this kind of approach to, um, to other regions and economies or governments that are not part of APEC. Next slide. Now, the third priority area to, that we wanted to mention is COVID-19 vaccines, which I think is almost everybody's uh, priority. Um, and we, we see this, our work in, in um, COVID-19 vaccines in three main um, buckets. One is helping to build and maintain trust in COVID vaccines. And I'll just touch on that for a moment. Uh, we are, we've been working with the US CDC in particular and at the WHO level. And that focus is on, um, is on communicating to stakeholders about the steps in quality assurance along the way um, to bringing vaccines to patients that we believe um, a lot of the community is not aware of. That being aware and having um, greater understanding of the quality checks is one way to build some trust. And if not in the general public, certainly with healthcare practitioners. Um, we have on March 15th, a, a webinar a global webinar that um, WHO is co-sponsoring with us about this very topic. Um, we are looking at um, ways to address substandard and falsified um, vaccines. And um, a couple of areas of note are toolkits for um, regulators to look at basic quality attributes of vaccines. These aren't, um, these are not monographs, but just basic toolkits to look at some fundamental basics. Um, which is, would be a first step in, in assessing whether a product was substandard or certainly falsified. Um, training and toolkits for healthcare practitioners, which we'll come back to that, and that's for administration. Um, and then training at the, at the regional level and sharing best practice. Uh, next slide, please. Um, just briefly, um, noting that um, you know there, the we have a, a full suite of um, standards that are available to um, vaccine developers, 
Um, these are not product specific standards, but really important standards for key components of a vaccine, if you will, and the, um, the, the distribution of vaccines. Um, we have worked with um, many collaborators in developing these tools and they're noted on the right. We made a very conscious effort to uh, make stakeholders very aware of these important resources. Next slide. Um, as um, one of the programs we're very proud of is um, the Promoting the Quality of Medicines program, which is work that um, is funded by um, the USAID and has been administered by USP for um, almost 25 years um, in various forms of the program. Um, in this program, we work with national regulatory authorities. Now, uh, it's over 40 national regulatory authorities to help build capabilities to, um, for them to um, identify um, um, substandard and falsified medicines and to help ensure the supply of quality medicines in their countries. Um, this has provided us with some important insights and perspectives on these, um, on these countries. And we have provided guidance on the rollout of COVID-19 vaccines that draws upon experience from these and other countries. Next slide. Some work that um, we've launched um, just recently is what, the, what we're calling a COVID-19 vaccine handling toolkit, which is operational guidance for what you, would, you may think of as the last 25 feet of, um, of the COVID-19 vaccine supply chain. These are guidance for healthcare practitioners on preparation, storage, handling, um, and in some cases, um, administration as well. Um, this, this toolkit today is, has a uh, focus on the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine and the Moderna vaccine, but we're in the process of expanding the toolkit to add um, specific handling guidance for other vaccines. There's some very important um, guidance in, in, um, in the toolkit, such as um, guidance on how healthcare um, practitioners can extract the maximum um, volume of doses out of a given vial. So this obviously is really essential work in terms of broadening access to the vaccine. Um, we've done all of this work, uh, has gone through USP's um, healthcare safety and quality expert committees, and it's been in collaboration with the US CDC and the FDA. And as we expand other vaccines, we're working with regulators from other parts of the world as well. Next slide. And finally, um, sorry, this slide's a little bit hard to read on the screen. Um, work in preventing and identifying substandard and falsified um, treat COVID treatments and preventatives. Something that we've done that I think is, is really important, um, while not harmonization, it's certainly a global tool is work that's been done with the International Meeting of World Pharmacopoeias, where we've created a, um, a dashboard, if you will, of authorized medicines and monographs for those, in, <clears throat> for those medicines um, so that it's a resource around the world to regulators so that they, they have what they need to, um, to try to, or at least they have the, the documentary standards they need to, um, to deal with. Um, substandard products. We've also developed um, analytical toolkits um, for um, many of these products. And um, something that's, um, that was really important at the beginning of the um, pandemic was guidance on quality hand rubs or hand sanitizers. This work was done, again, very closely with the US FDA when the quality of hand sanitizer that was compounded was really, um, there were quite a few issues with it. Um, and um, manufacturer hand sanitizer was in short supply. This guidance also, this document also provides guidance on distiller hand sanitizer. So we, we're, we're launching training initiatives around the world at this very moment um, on this, on this um, guidance and that's available to stakeholders anywhere. Um, next slide, please. 
Um, we're providing, I wanted to provide some links to some of these resources, which will be in the, um, in the slide deck um, follow, following the meeting. So thank you very much. And thanks again for, um, for inviting us. Look forward to the panel discussion. Um, I, at the outset, in fact, I want to thank IPA for giving me opportunity to speak on uh, some of the global views in, with respect to regulatory affairs. I want to focus on the central theme of the conference, which is patient centricity. And uh, based on the recent experience on COVID, what helped the world or what is helping the world in overcoming the crisis, in my view, is uh, partnerships across various stakeholders. So my talk is predominantly focused on the partnership that helped all of us in focusing our efforts towards patient care. Next slide, please. So disclaimer, the contents in this presentation are based on my personal thoughts, ideas, and opinions, but not of Pfizer. Next slide, please. Yeah, like many organizations, governments, economists, and entrepreneurs, they say, we are living in OCA world, which is volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous, and we are vulnerable to disruption without any notice. The recent example, if I see in COVID is one recent example where we all have been challenged, which we never predicted in the past. As the key stakeholders with focus on patient care, the question actually that I want to ask all of us is that, are we ready to face another pandemic? And looking at how things are being managed over the last one year, like I mentioned earlier, what is helping us is the partnerships, the collaborations, which we have never seen in, in the past. So I'm going to, in fact, touch upon the important aspects of partnerships between regulators, between policymakers, industry, et cetera, to better serve the patients. Next slide, please. Like I mentioned, for all the stakeholders, like policymakers, regulatory agencies, industry, academia, risk organizations, pharmacopoeia, all together, we have one shared objective that is serving patients with safe, effective, affordable medicines in a timely manner. Next slide, please. The first thing I want to touch upon is the partnerships between regulatory agencies and policymakers, which is very key in serving the patients better. Next slide, please. I just want to touch upon what has worked well, what is working well. Now, if you look at the partnership between EMA and USFDA, they have made great progress in coming together in uh, bringing patients faster to the world. If you see 90% of the new, new, new drug approvals, if you look at them, there is a great element between EMA and USFDA in the, the, the way they make decisions in approving new drug products. That's a great news. Then you see them continuing their investment, their efforts, and diverting their focus, time, efforts, energies, all towards patient centricity. Whether if it's a, it's a mutual recognition act or whether conducting joint inspections across the world, exchanging reports, inspection observations, a lot of things they have been doing actually in, in recent past, which is very good news. The most recent is batch testing waiver. If you recall, uh, in fact, earlier for distribution in Europe, you need to have actually the product tested in Europe. But again, there is a recent, in fact, waiver that has been agreed between EMA and USFDA is that if the product is tested and released in USFDA, US, then you don't have to be retested in Europe. So there's a great progress made. I think they, they are partnering very well. And the, there is an increasing convergence, which is actually helping to uh, helping uh, patients receive the medicines much faster. Next slide, please. Another great example is nitrosamines. It was uh, mentioned, also touched upon by previous speakers very nicely. In case of nitrosamines, which is a common issue, common challenge that the entire industry is uh, dealing with together, the Health Canada, in fact, has uh, has has uh, in fact started an international strategy group uh, under chairmanship, and in fact. The members are seven different uh, agencies like Health Canada, EMA, USFDA, MHLW, TGA, Singapore, 
uh, agency and systematic. Now, they would actually coordinated uh, very well all their efforts in dealing with the nitrosamine problem. Then uh, now today, because of their well-coordinated efforts, there has been so much exchange of information that is gathered by, by these agencies and by the industry, and they have shared the methods that have been developed by various companies and the data sets. Now that helped, the outcome that you see now because of this collaboration is now, they came up with inter internationally recognized acceptable daily intake limits, which can be followed by uh, all other uh, agencies and uh, countries across, across the world. So I, why I want to go to this example is the collaboration of the agencies in, in an outstanding manner is really helping in conquering some of the common challenges that the industry is facing. Next slide, please. So the learning from this nitrosamine forum group is that based on this, the EMA has created a lessons learned group uh, and they have made certain recommendations. Why stop the collaboration only with nitrosamine? In fact, we anticipate many crises, many challenges, many incidents as we are living in a Boca world. So the experiences that we gathered from the Nitrosamines Working Group has to be really extrapolated and we should continue the good work in future. So the recommendation from this uh, Lessons Learned Group is that create a strategic working group whenever there is a crisis, when there is a global challenge and exchange even what is considered as a confidential information uh, between the regulatory, regulatory agencies because public health always actually is, comes above the confidentiality clauses and so we should continue to exchange information between the regulatory agencies there should be continued uh, convergence. Then also on the GMPs and information exchange and workload sharing, I think th there is a recommendation to increase collaboration, increase opportunities, opportunities to support each other so that we'll be able to uh, deal many such issues like nitrosamines in future. Whether it's toxicological data review or risk assessment, PV data review, in many areas, I think partnerships should be formed between the regulatory, regulatory agencies so that the crisis can be managed much uh, faster. Next slide, please. Although there is, has been good work going on between different regulators in terms of convergence, uh, there are still some opportunities where I think, uh, where in fact focus can be given to the greater uh, level uh, in coming together. So one example I want to mention is a real-time regulatory data exchange. When an application files a, a dossier across the different, re, different regulatory agencies, probably I think there can be one opportunity in sharing the data in real time. So that can help, in fact, faster review of the applications and speedy approvals and uh, enabling um, the patients to receive the medicines much faster across, uh, across the world. Then maybe you can, there is also opportunity for uh, in some occasions to respect and uh, approve the data generated for one registration application so that that can help in that can help in minimizing the duplicate testing maybe you can sacrifice less lab rats and maybe uh, maybe do i mean don't have to really uh, do repetitive uh, studies on human human uh, volunteers i think these are the opportunities where in fact health health uh, regulators can really come together and uh, help the applicants then regulatory harmonization, in fact, I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, one global dossier in the subsequent slide. I'm, we don't know whether, I'm sure, in fact, this is the one question that actually bothers all of us is whether it has become a reality, whether it's a it's still dream. Now, if you look at the drug development data standards, in fact, in uh, various regulatory, in regulatory guidelines, you see sometimes, I mean, to some extent, actually differences in the expected data set requirements, ex, uh, ex, expected uh, the standards. That is still actually one of the gaps, I think, that can be really addressed by the regulatory agencies across the world. Risk-based approach, I know when there is a crisis, when there is a pandemic, certainly there is an intention to uh, speed up the regulatory approval process. There's a great work. I think that should continue uh, even uh, be beyond in future. Another thing I want to mention is, uh, as an opportunity for greater convergence is uh, pharmacopoeal convergence. I know this in, uh, uh, the, if you see, look at look at that. Of course, ICH has, ICH has really made a great initiative in bringing harmonization in general chapters. But again, if you look at the specific product, specific monographs, I'm sure that all of you are aware that with respect to specific product monographs, sometimes there's still, in fact, some differences in whether it's a specification requirement or a method that is actually included in one of the monographs, monographs 
or even sometimes even the listing of the impurities, the impurity specifications. In many areas, they, there you see the differences between pharmacopoeia. Probably, I think uh, that that is one opportunity where, in fact, pharmacopoeia. I mean, great work is being done the way Anthony mentioned. But again, I am sure, in fact, there is a greater opportunity in uh, maybe ensuring pharmacopoeial convergence so that actually reduces the burden on applicants on the industry because when uh, in fact, you file a dossier complying to USP probably. The dossier probably has to be tweaked when you're filing in Europe to comply with the BP and UP, EP monograph. Sometimes that actually uh, requires additional work that is to be done by applicants and maybe those things can really be looked at together by uh, various pharmacopoeal, uh, pharmacopoeal commissions and uh, look for opportunities to bring convergence. That will help the industry. Next slide, please. And I mentioned about one global dossier in my previous slide. I think there's one interesting topic. I think the industry, we keep talking about it. Uh, of course, we, uh, we have been hearing about it for probably, I think, uh, more than a decade or maybe two decades. And it is still, I think, I feel, uh, is we have not achieved actually, uh, the, we have not made progress to the desired level. Uh, the one good news is that a decade ago, I think not many, in fact, uh, regulate, regulators are actually have mandated the CTT template. But now today, in fact, most of the countries across the world, there, in fact, they have switched to the CTT template. And on template perspective, in fact, there is a lot of uh, harmonization. But again, if you if you still see the requirement, regulatory requirements for product approval, I, I still feel, in fact, there is an opportunity. Now, in, once, in fact, we have convergence between the regulators, I think the product approvals can be really much faster. Ultimately, I think we all want a drug to be available across the globe simultaneously or at least uh, maybe it reasonably should reach the patients across the world um, in, in within time so that is our uh, objective but again in that perspective probably there is an opportunity for uh, regulators in coming together and bringing more consistency then also one other thing what that can be looked looked up uh, looked up uh, is that maybe possibility of leveraging approvals by one one uh, country maybe uh, by other countries that's where I think with the minimal administrative data. Of course, I recognize that maybe you need actually customization depending upon climatic zones, zone relevant stability data has to be generated. There's no, no doubt in that. Sometimes even in clinical studies, you need to perform some additional bridging, bridging studies. Of course, they, they are all very important. You cannot really challenge the expectations. But again, in majority of the cases, maybe if you can lever leverage the dossier that is filed in one, one market, I think that will really speed up uh, the approvals in ac across the uh, across the globe. Uh, one example I want to bring is the QBD. Of course, uh, ICH has uh, rolled out in um, uh, Q8 years ago the QBD concept. But again, today it is actually not at actually been a mandatory requirement in many countries except US. Although Europe they encourage the QBD approach, uh, but still actually we don't see the in fact you know, the consistency across uh, various regulatory requirements. Another thing is actually, if you look at the post approval change management, one simple example I can give you that legal entity name change in some countries, it is just a notification, but again, in some countries, some regulators actually, they require a prior approval supplement. It, ne it needs to be, in fact, it takes a lot of time sometimes in getting an approval for simple legal entity name change. So these are the differences actually, I still see uh, the difference in the dosage requirements between regulator markets and the rest of the world. And there's the one thing actually, if that can be addressed, I think, uh, I think uh, regulatory harmonization that really becomes a reality. Next slide, please. Then some more opportunities for greater convergence uh, of health authorities. So like I mentioned, medicines for all across the globe. Now, generally, in fact, the tendency is to file in a regulated market. Maybe there, when there is a new drug application or new generic, the tendency is always actually to file in the US then the uh, rest of the world actually becomes an next priority. Yeah, but again, can we in fact think of a situation, can we dream that when the product, actually new product is, uh, is approved in US, within no time, can we expect a, a, that similar product getting approved in maybe a country like Kenya or maybe Bangladesh, et cetera. I think that's the world actually we want to see where in fact medicines are available at, at, uh, at probably at a reasonable time across the globe. I think if you have that dream, I think we are not re near, in fact, uh, realizing that dream because of the differences in the regulatory requirement across uh, health authorities. And that's what actually I, I want to bring up as an opportunity for 
all the health, health authorities across the world. Now, what can be done is the way, in fact, ICH actually has done a wonderful job in setting up actually a template for CTD, which is now followed almost by all countries in, in, the, in the world. Probably I think countries can, regulatory agencies can come together, roll out some international data standards, uh, which can be, I think they can influence, in fact, they can bring all the health authorities together and they can really help ad adopting these uh, common standards across, uh, across the globe. Then what happens, we can really see what is called as a, what is what we dream as a one dossier that actually that meets, uh, one, one global dossier that meets uh, all health uh, uh, regulatory requirements. Of course, it is not an e easy task. Certainly work has to be done and you have to bring health authorities together. But again, uh, I think that's a dream we all aspire to uh, realize in future. Now, if you see especially uh, the, uh, between the developed and uh, emerging market, there's still actually alignment in regulatory framework and systems. Like I mentioned, one simple example is a legal entity change where in fact, uh, regulated markets may just give you an approval by notification, but again, some of the even the emerging markets, uh, I have seen that you have to file a prior approval uh, variation. Then actually, that takes in fact more than a few months, uh, yeah, few, few months for getting approval for affecting the legal entity change. So th these are the some some of the examples I want to uh, I want to quote. And certainly, there is an opportunity for mutual recognition efforts. The way, in fact, EU, EU has done a wonderful job. In 27 countries, maybe one dossier that can really help you in getting approval in 27 markets. But again, can we really think of similar actually forum that can be created if at least in uh, maybe in uh, zone wise, maybe whether it's the GCC, of course, the GCC is working actively now, bring bringing some consistency in, in the zone. But then again, SAR countries again, there again, they're working at continental level. I think uh, there is a great effort in the, there's certainly a commitment by various regulatory agencies to at least form small, small groups like similar to EMA. EMA. I think we are in the right direction, but again, much more work uh, I think needs to be done to bring convergence at least in, in uh, maybe ethnicity on ethnicity basis or on the continent basis. Uh, I think there is a, there is a opportunity for uh, health agencies to come together. Next slide, please. Yeah, that's about tech convergence opportunities between health authorities and the policymakers. Now I would like to touch upon the partnership opportunities uh, between in industry that can really help uh, in patient, greater patient care. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. I'm sure in fact you have seen this in the, in the media for the first time maybe in history, 10 pharma giants like Pfizer, Novartis, GSK, etc. they came together, they took a pledge focusing their uh, efforts on one purpose. As we never had of a such collaboration uh, between the competitors, but again, the intention is, I think this is not the time when there is a crisis, this is not the time to compete with each other. Uh, we need to really direct all of our efforts uh, and uh, resources in the dealing with the common issues, com common problems. I think that's a fantastic example that is set out by these companies. And uh, even if I would like to in fact compliment IPA, IPA in fact in India actually came together I think six giants have actually have come together to, to help Indian pharma industry. This is one great example, and that we all should be proud of, uh, should feel proud of in Indian uh, industry. And we need to, in fact, you know, uh, think of more such collaborations to, in fact, to enable greater uh, support to patients. Next slide, please. I just would like to give some examples that uh, about uh, industry collaborations which have been seen, which have seen recently. I talked about IPA. Then uh, uh, Pfizer BioNTech co development of COVID 19 vaccine, then Novartis and Sanofi. In fact, we are leveraging the, their manufacturing capabilities for manufacturing the Pfizer vaccine. Then Icon has been our partner in clinical trial services. Then also Pfizer has partnered with several uh, global logistic partners for supply chain, for dealing with the supply chain, because it's a real complex, uh, complex issue in making sure that vaccines are available in different parts of the world. Then Again, we we have we know how AstraZeneca and uh, University of Oxford they came together, then Moderna and uh, even the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Even in India, Bharat Biotech and ICMR they in fact they displayed great partnerships, and also uh, when uh, in fact Pfizer in fact supported in fact uh, as a manufacturer for Gilead when Remdesivir has been uh, in, in demand to treat uh, COVID uh, infection cases. Then another example I want to India has done a great job in uh, maybe supplying to the world hydroxychloroquine. I remember actually in Gujarat itself, there were 68 uh, companies which actually came together. They got licenses, 
and they supplied hydroxychloroquine several times to the world. Yeah, in fact, there, there are a lot of success stories where industry came together uh, in partnership with uh, research institutes and in partner with the academia. I think great job has been done, but again, we should continue these uh, collaborations even going forward. Next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah. So apart from collaborations between industry and industry, I think industry and agency also should really come together much more than actually what we have been doing so far. Because if you see, the technological revolutions are happening at very rapid speed than regulatory revisions. We see that overnight the rule book becomes obsolete. What actually has been a, in fact, guiding principle, a regulation yesterday becomes actually obsolete and irrelevant in no time. Because actually, the, like, like I mentioned, there is a great revolution in the technology, and we are talking about AI based revolutions and the robotic process automation and digital pills then gene therapies. Actually, in fact, industry is really, in fact, making a lot of efforts in maybe serving patients with the greater technology. Now, in fact, I also happen to have read uh, just yesterday one of the reports that was released by MGA, McKinsey Global Institute. The prediction is, is that in future, the robotic process automation and the digitalization is going to be up to five, five times. So that is actually, that is a future. Uh, maybe if you see that therapies are actually are going to be much more based on latest technologies, robotics, digitalization, artificial intelligence, etc. Now, when uh, industry is actually growing at the speed of science, it's also necessary for industry to work with health authorities right from the start, right from the develop, develop, development stage, hold their hands, we partner with them and uh, help health authorities to catch up with the speed of science. That's a very crucial, uh, maybe in uh, helping maybe regulators to maybe uh, understand the technological advancement that are actually coming up in industry and helping them in uh, uh, ensuring product approvals much faster, because it's very important. Now, if you see uh, how, if you see across the world, how many regulatory agencies are really in fact ready to in fact to approve an application based on gene therapy? How many regulatory agencies are really ready to approve an application for a digital pill? So I don't I don't think actually actually we, the whole world actually is actually going at the same speed. Probably think that's where actually industry can really step forward and work with the, the agencies right from the start and maybe help the help help actually the everybody actually grow at the same speed so that that they can serve uh, the patients much much better. Recently, one, another example I want to give you is actually FDA came up with an innovation challenge to seek alternatives to the ethylene oxide sterilization. Of course, the industry actually has partnered with FDA wonderfully, and uh, now we are looking at uh, what are the possible alternatives to replace ethylene oxide in sterilization of devices. Another important thing uh, I want to mention is actually partnership with academia. I'm not talking much uh, about academia industry partnerships. I know that there is one session later uh, in this conference about industry academia partnership. But again, what I want to mention is that India is uh, one of the young countries, right, with the average age of about maybe 20s. Now, in future, the, the graduates that are coming from academic institute, they are going to join the industry. They are going to actually run, run the industry in future. And it's our responsibility, even um, people working in industry and people, people who are serving the academia, to make sure that the educational system is also actually upgraded to the level of the work that's happening in industry. Otherwise, actually, what we see, sometimes I see the, I see the gap between uh, the, maybe the knowledge that is imparted in educational institutions and the requirements of industry. Because, the, because the, at the speed of technology, there's actually the, that you see in industry. So education reforms are again, not, not in fact, not in align, not aligned with the, the way technological revolutions are seen. So it's a important, it's a actually very crucial for, in fact, to serve industry better, the academic institutes also have to be upgraded to, to the to the level industry is actually expecting. Then what happens, you will have the graduates and postgraduates who are industry ready when they pass out from this um, from these universities. In fact, Pfizer, in fact, we have signed MOEs with some of the prestigious universities uh, like Bits Pilani or JSS, Manipal, etc. And in some cases, we are also actually working with them in in uh, maybe uh, helping them in reform, uh, bringing some reforms in the curriculum. I think all the industry, I think the members, I think should really consider actively connecting with academia to make sure that the when graduates pass out from uh, their courses, they are industry ready. I think that's very important for all of us because otherwise, in, after 10 years later, 
we don't we don't want uh, the maybe the graduates to unlearn what they were taught and relearn and learn new things that really in fact uh, puts a lot of pressure uh, in uh, in uh, getting into action so i think that they should be ready from day one i think that's our objective next slide please yeah i think uh, uh, some of the great lessons that we that we all have learned from covid-19 vaccine emergency authorization i think first time in the history we have an emergency authorization within a year that happened because the way in fact the the industry came together i gave some examples then uh, regulators they came together then uh, rolling review actually one is a one thing that really regulators have really done uh, on based on the risk based approach and that really expedited approval process now this crisis actually really tested all of us and this helped all of us to give our best and operate at the best now having experienced this why should we really limit these best practices limit only for uh, this pandemic why not actually these best practices be new normal for all of us at industry level and also at a regulator level the covid-19 success story i think should continue even going forward for all the in fact the work that we do in future whether it is a uh, therapies for cancer or alzheimer's or muscular dystrophy or even name the rare diseases that actually the world is struggling with i think that we should continue these uh, partnerships these collaborations these liaisons and the convergence i think to deal with all the challenges the challenges that are on the table today and i think that's how i think we all can re refocus reorient our focus on patient centricity patient care and uh, clearly what has been achieved in these times is basically uh, due to excellent partnerships between the health agencies industry academia research organizations pharmacopeial commissions etc i think we should continue uh, imparting these lessons in everything that we do in future next slide please yeah this is my last slide i just want to complete everyone who is in the room india has actually lots of advantage we are actually uniquely positioned because historically it has been actually powerhouse for api technology and having a greater supply of apis and even generics there is a strong chemistry foundation in fact great competencies in researching and developing novel complex formulations the manufacturing infrastructure is one of the best in the world and even the regulatory understanding and compliance mindset is one of the best and also we are operating in we should be thankful and, and uh, to the associations like ipa uh, and uh, even the regulators we are actually operating in very supportive ecosystem that's actually a blessing to us and again education system whether you call uh, name iits or maybe iims or even bits or any prestige institute you name in fact there is a great education system then uh, even in it world actually we are actually one of the best i think one of the best brains in, in the world because the, in the future is going to certainly be going to be ai based and uh, robotic based and uh, digital pills these are things that are going to be in future and we have the strength actually we have the it brains in, in india and uh, apart from all that in fact the way we have been serving the world over decades the in, in, in fact indian industry has a great collaborative spirit and global mindset and with great entrepreneurial capabilities with all this strength i think i'm sure in fact india will continue to be in fact the one pharmacy that world can look to for uh, serving the patient not only in india across the world with this in fact i want to thank ipa once again for giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts and uh, thanks to the audience for your patient listening thank you so much So firstly I wish to thank IPA and Mr Belakure for inviting me to represent Glenmark on this forum and I wish to namaste everyone from Glenmark house in Mumbai uh my presentation because I see that now we have very limited time uh, the session is about to end by 6 o'clock and I have only 9 more minutes and then we have to do even a question answer session as well so I don't want to take much time because my presentation is extension of ms biacha and mr babu they have already spoken of but i have few life examples which definitely make an impact on that how we are working on global regulatory when it comes to generics and as we all know that india has taken a lead on uh, affordable medicine to global patient population i represent typical generic organization on behalf of india and then that's where i wanted to emphasize on some examples so quickly to i i won't take much time i would quickly browse through
the slide deck and would like to conclude on. So next slide, please. Next, please. So I just wanted to convey that though we are very optimistic, as Ms. Beata has already explained that though we are talking of a lot of harmonization, but still the road is bumpy. So our really what we think is this so simple, but it is in real life, it is not so simple. Next slide, please. These are the complex authorities where we are working and there are uh, policy makers, ICH, ICH, WHO, IPA, and still there are some gaps though industry and um, regulators are working together. However, there is a lot which needs to be done. Next, please. This year, like even in pandemic, FDA has done commendable job and they have given a lot of like, you know, approvals. They have attended to number of control correspondences, meetings, everything, which led the pave to like, you know, global submission because Hardly generic companies, they do development for all emerging markets. They primarily rely on development, which is done for parent regulatory authority, either for US or Europe. So there was an opportunity to leverage. However, because emerging market agencies were not so like open to take up because of pandemic and industry lost a lot of opportunities to provide affordable medicine. And we have faced a lot of issues from emerging market where agencies were not open to take up years for review. Next, please. One aspect which like Dr. Uh, Bab Mr. Babu has already uh, talked about licenses. CPP is like, and I just want to focus on some very critical element where how complex the whole process is. CPP, there is a WHO definition which clearly says that it re reflect that there is no need to do a quality, safety, and efficacy of the product need not to be proved once the product is registered in either country of origin or in reference country. However, if we look at, this is a very key bottleneck to put the product across the market. And how complex the process to get the CPP, I just would like to go through and uh, put across the table since there are global regulators who are, uh, audience is also there and speakers are also there so it's a good opportunity for me to spell out that what the concern challenges we face and next slide please so if if a product which is primarily um, many products like industry is developing for export purpose and which are not registered in india and to get a cpp many times it so happened that the company has to register the product in india and which is a very cumbersome process and if you don't have any intention to commercialize the product in India, you have to go through the painful process and then you have to provide a CPP, though the product is already approved in US and Europe. I see that I think this is a good opportunity for regulators to look into it. Do we really need this kind of process? Next slide, please. There are typical check boxes if you look at in the typical format of WHO 1.2, 1.3, which says that both the columns, if yes, yes, has to be there and the list of countries are there that unless you don't have yes, yes, you won't be able to move ahead with your submission. There are a set of countries which say that one activity like your product is approved in country of origin, however, not commercialized, acceptable, there are a handful of countries. And there are a handful of countries which say that it, if it is no, no, it is acceptable. So it's a very painful, very cumbersome process and it is a determining factor whether the dossier can be submitted to country where country like company want to uh, do business and definitely it has an impact on again affordability in emerging market which we primarily always talk about that and generic is always towards affordable and quality medication so this element i think uh, needs to be looked into that do we really need this next slide please nitrous i mean um um, my friend Anthony has already spoken about, even Mr. Babu has spoken about. And this is like, you know, see, industry has proactively taken a lot of initiatives. And uh, even yesterday, we received a communication from USFDA that now they have extended the deadline to complete the entire assessment from 1st March to 31st March. This entire process of, you know, assessing because every time authorities are coming out with newer impurities and industry has an issue like, you know, vendor declaration, because on API, it is completely from chemistry, then process, then reprocessing, 
and from drug product then all the vendors be it excipient packaging material all the components put together we have to see that whether the there is a risk or not vendors are like many excipient manufacturer many packaging uh, material manufacturer they are not equipped to do this kind of assessment and we are primarily relying on theoretical risk assessment and wherever we see that there is a risk industry has to do a lot of uh, analysis how many it is going to be like you know as as we progress further as industry as authorities gather a lot of information from industry it is going to be a endless journey i foresee that many more impurities are going to be included in this list and definitely this is going to be a hit on industry because all the getting the impurities developing sensitive method developing laboratories where the lab where we have to test it should be approved by local authority like health canada they have announced that the lab where you conduct you test the nitrosamine has to be approved by health canada so these kind of expectations are emerging i think there is a need to do a harmonization on this going forward next please compendial harmonization challenge as uh, and mr babu has already spoken of i just wanted to share few examples where you can see that there are certain countries which has like you know um, recognition towards european requirement there are set of countries which are towards american usp requirement so if you see the pharmacopia both like they 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 talk about quality you meet you comply with usp it's a quality product you comply with europe it is quality product however there is a difference in impurity this is just one example is clobetazole propionate there is another there are, there are, there are a couple of examples like we superprolol you can see that usp talks about only total impurity however in european pharmacopeia there are host of impurities getting those impurities developing method validating the method everything has direct impact on affordability also and at the same time delay in entire like you know entering into the market so so i think both both talks about quality however there is a, there are gaps so there is a lot of room to harmonize all these uh, like things that do we really are we looking at safety of the patient population or affordability there has to be a balance between both and this offers an opportunity for policy makers and industry to come together and to derive a mechanism whereby we can come out with a optimum specification which definitely demonstrate that there is a safety also and there is a affordable affordability also next slide please leveraging data from us europe to emerging market there is not a single authority which except approved us dosier as such or a approved dosier uh, which is which is already approved by european authority there is not a single authority where i can put the parent dosier for straight approval or registration and that lot of local requirement has to be done and that takes a lot of time for example in brazil the method validation criteria is far tighter than ICH and you have to do method validation at the site of manufacturing and quality control in the uh, NVISA approved laboratory and then you have to do a tech transfer method transfer for QC release so there's too much of work which is there though the product is already like you know developed for other markets and it comply with ICH you have to do all those things so that is there is a room to do a harmonization next slide please you can see that uh, global comparator how many countries are encouraging global comparator you can see the emojis i put in the russia they need their own bio their cl own clinical brazil against there even though the comparator the reference product is qualitatively same their manufacturing site is same i mean holder is same but still they don't agree to accept one common bio study and that's the pain point for genetic industry i think these are the opportunities for for harmonization next slide please country specific uh, uh, guidelines as like uh, mr babu has already spoken of that there are pack differences zone obviously there is no choice but we have to do however there are lot many very very country specific expectations like russia recently they have moved to eau requirement which is totally different than usp or european pharmacopeia they have their own pharmacopeia their expectations they have their own set of expectations where we really need to do a lot of work and on labeling amendment also like you know there are different brand names across the globe and it's very difficult for the organization to have a single brand name because of 
lot of legal issues and that studies and it, it put a lot of uh, burden on the industry to do all these kind of multiple labeling. Next slide, please. There is a shift in uh, like, you know, complex requirement. If you look at typically earlier, US FDA was into Q1, Q2. Now it is moving towards Q1, Q2, Q3. Even for the products which were not designed for CT, they're also not directly. However, there are a lot many questions which are flowing for even Q3 compliances as well. So it is becoming more complex and industry has to align with to enter into market. So obviously this also is an like I don't see this as an area for harmonization still. This lead to a lot of uh, complexity and late entry into the market, obviously. So it puts a burden on industry. At the same time, industry has to ensure that there is an interchangeability and uh, um, equivalence is demonstrated with the reference products. So these are like some complexities which industry is facing day by day. Uh, obviously, there is no choice, but we have to live with. Next slide, please. Complex generics, as more and more complex generics are like earlier, it was very traditional um, generic way used to like, you know, the complex products were also dealt in a traditional manner. But now with drug revised, a lot of uh, characterization studies and it's very, it's getting very difficult. Even generic companies are also struggling to enter into market early. First review cycle is as good as impossible for complex generics. Very few companies could crack it. And wherever the first generic is there, then it takes almost four to five years to have a generic approved with US FDA. So things are becoming more complex and lot this lead to a lot of lot of work. However, this is how the regulatory environment is evolving and industry is aligning. Next slide, please. IIG is another complex area where, like you know, this is a typical web in which only US FDA has this kind of criteria, whereas the global authorities, they never ask for this kind of information. And European authorities were always very innovative in their approaches and they're very straightforward and simple. However, you can see that there are so many IG databases, like recently I've extracted this data from um, database uh, and you can see that more than 12,000 different um, IG evaluation has to be done across the doses form. So it's a complex web in which we are operating and there are challenges every time which MBD to refer, nomenclature, and there are industry even um, opinions are also there. So there is a need to simplify on this area. Next slide, please. You can see that uh, in a normal course, like you know, a patient takes glipizide uh, for diabetic patient, and then he has uh, hypertensive, he's hypertensive also in addition to that ranitidine. And if you see the cumulative microcrystalline cellulose put together, if he is consuming all these tab tablets together, obviously he is exceeding all the IG level, but still for individual uh, doses, the industry has to evaluate and there is a risk of RTR. So I think somewhere, uh, holistically, this needs to be looked in. Next slide, please. I don't want to talk about more as like, you know, I have already, IG is definitely an area where some uh, simplification can be done through like partnership between USFD and industry. Next slide, please. So these are key takeaways, what I feel that industry and health, author health authorities need to work more closely than ever in current scenario to bring harmonization. And as my uh, friends, uh, Mr. Diata and Mr. Babu has already spoken about, I think there is a need to work together to make, uh, like to have accessible, affordable medicine at affordable, like, you know, and then quality without compromising on quality and safety of the product. So I think there's a lot of collaboration is needed. However, at the end of the day, what I see that it offers a lot of opportunity to for pharma industry to do a lot of work. And uh, even um, there is like, you know, opportunity for, gen uh, for, for to generate employment also, like, you know, because more and more complex environment, it definitely creates a lot of opportunity for scientific arena to do more work and to understand that, yes, do we really need harmonization to what extent we can do it and a collaboration between industry, academia and regulator definitely is going to make our life more comfortable, specifically for Genric. So um, with this note, I would like to thank you, IPA once again.
this interaction. Thanks, thank, thank you very much. So thank you so much. Uh, the presentations were really uh, very much impacting. I think you touched upon, all of you touched upon all the relevant topics that uh, are the need of the hour. And uh, it started with Biata, where she spoke about the harmonization. And you also spoke about the requirement to collaborate and uh, come towards uh, a common platform. And then followed by all three of you, there's Anthony, uh, Dr. Jain, and Dr. Babu speaking about uh, uh, the nitrosamine impurities, which is such an important topic now. And I'm sure that all of you remember the times. Uh, it was somewhere in June of 2018 that we came across uh, this as one of the uh, communication from the regulatory agency. And since then, almost every day, all of us are discussing this topic uh, within our companies, and we're trying to see how best we can uh, resolve it. So it's a big challenge for all of us. Uh, but uh, in the whole process that I find that uh, when you look at uh, uh, the current scenario, I think uh, most of you touched upon the COVID situation also. So that's something that has been a challenge and we learned a lot from uh, the COVID uh, last year and we'll continue to uh, do that. So my question to uh, Biata here is, um, you spoke about uh, the harmonization. Uh, what kind of uh, collaborations you normally do with your uh, partners or say, Pharmacopil uh, partners within Europe, and what exactly are the uh, challenges you face uh, in terms of uh, collaborations, or at least you know for us, when we look at uh, the filings, uh, we have two categories of filing. One is the highest regulated uh, market, and uh, we call it the less regulated market or semi-regulated market. So, is there something that can be done to harmonize it better? and uh, what kind of collaborations you have with the uh, pharmacopoeia within your geography? Um, I think that um, if you look about uh, a filing, um, I look a bit to the future. So for me, it's really um, uh, the this question of the gap uh, in filing between, um, let's say, more, more highly, highly regulated markets and semi-regulated markets, it's, it's a question of, um, of really a um, few years probably to, to, to diminish this gap. Why I'm saying this? Because indeed um, you completely change perspective when you follow the developments in the ICH. Um, it's not anymore the exclusive club of uh, whatever six partners who started at the beginning to harmonize the environment for development of new chemical entities, but it's now, um, I just counted a um, um, number of, of countries uh, or um, I would say not even individual countries, but regional uh, initiatives. And we are over 40 uh, regulators, uh, as I said, individual countries, plus uh, like APAC, uh, or let's say regional organizations. So uh, some of them have, have a status of um, regular members. Some of them are uh, observers, like for example, still Indian uh, authorities. But there is a clear move in the direction of applying ICH uh, uh, guidelines, standards more and more. So I think it's a question really of, of relatively short future when we will really see the, the progress also in, I would say, semi-regulated countries. Um, and, and, and that's very clear when I see now, um, for example, even from the generic industry, um, when we look at the scope of, of guidelines, now we regularly assess how it applies to generics, biosimilars. So basically the topics and, and the scope is much more now um, universally applicable to um, not only to the new chemical entities. So we have much a stronger voice. And I must say that talking about cooperation and our engagement as an as an industry and also an association at this moment about IGBA, but obviously um, 
I'm talking also about uh, uh, um, IPA uh, engagement. We nominate now, uh, we nominated, I think, more than around 30 experts to different, uh, I mean, around 30 experts to various uh, experts groups. So it's, um, it's, it's maybe not that visible uh, for, for external world, but we really made a huge progress as an industry in sense of visibility and contribution uh, to, to individual topics. And also we have um, um, also the representatives from Indian uh, industry very, very strong in, uh, in, in, in this expert uh, pool. So I think it really um, shows how much uh, this industry um, um, made a progress in sense of, of going towards harmonization and higher standards. So um, for me, the thing about um, these gaps um, it's a bit old-fashioned, sorry to say, but I think it's moved to the, it's really, I see the move towards um, much more, um, yeah, uh, harmonized way uh, and also uh, developments within companies to, to move towards higher standards. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, this question is to uh, Anthony. Uh, Anthony, I know that, uh, you know, USP, when they thought about setting up a laboratory outside USA. Uh, the first choice was India, and uh, the laboratory which was set up in Hyderabad, uh, I would say about 15 years back uh, when it was started, I think this example of collaboration between two countries, and some of the best people, best brains and technology has been uh, uh, developed over there. Uh, how do you think uh, that India uh, as a country, and especially the laboratory in Hyderabad, uh, can support uh, the cancer or I would say the COVID related uh, development or uh, monographs or at least uh, you know the nitrosomine impurity related uh, uh, you know, methods uh, which are so much in requirement uh, in the current times. Uh, thank, thank you for the, the question and you're right the USP facility in Hyderabad is really state of the art not just the facility but um, we're very proud of the the caliber of our of the staff that works in that facility. It's central to the work that USP does all around the world. Um, I actually would like to just start with a um, just a mention of an event that USP and IPA are, are doing together in early April to bring together regulators, industry, academia to create a platform to talk about broadly about the, the global nitrosamine issues, including how we how we address them as a global um, medicines community. So, um, so that's coming up, and that that actually is partially an answer to your question. It's being led by our team in um, in Hyderabad. So, um, you know that that team is also central to developing and working with industry and regulators on. And new new analytical methods um, for the to address nitrosamines. So um, you know it's central, and I, I think we'll be able to leverage that going into the future for sure. If I could, if I could also just comment just a moment on um, harmonization of pharmacopoeia standards, because that, that's been mentioned a few times, and um, you know it's something we are well maybe maybe a couple of things. One. That effort has been very slow. I think everybody knows that. It's been uh, globally, it has not it has not been the most successful initiative. <laughs> um, it's not for a lack of trying though. You know, uh, many of the world's pharmacopoeias have spent a lot of time working on this. And I think what's, what's frequently forgotten or underlooked is that pharmacopoeia um, harmonization is dependent upon regulatory harmonization and in a way approvals harmonization. So the standards follow the approvals. So it's, it's a very complex, challenging, challenging thing that involves levels of, um, of regulation that pharmacopoeias don't necessarily impact. So that's just, a, it's not an excuse. It's just sort of a, a um, explanation of some of the challenges. Um, what I think has been a better approach is the looking at kind of a convergence of pharmacopoeial approaches, which is what we've been um, advocating, and that has had some shown some progress. 
and then focusing on the harmonization of standards that are most impactful, that are most important, that move across product categories. Um, so that's the direction that USP has been advocating with our pharmacopoeia partners. There, um, you know, there was a, a mention, I think this is, this is right, of course, that, um, you know, this is no longer about a, a club of a couple of regulators in a couple of countries. And we are working um, in PDG, which is an organization that includes three pharmacopoeias, the European, the Japanese, and USP. So we still work within that, but we also work in bilateral arrangements with major pharmacopoeias also. And as the one of the earlier slides noted, you know, there's a cluster of pharmacopoeias whose standards are also recognized and utilized by many other countries. So it's sort of this this patchwork, and you know that recognition by other countries. There's a degree of reliance there that the more reliance that, that develops, probably you get to at least a, a step closer to the goal of harmonization, even though it's not harmonization. So, um, so we're thinking about all of that. We need to talk about it more as a as a community. And I think it's what's important though, is it has to be a discussion with the pharmacopoeia community and the regulator community very broadly. Uh, thank you, Anthony. Uh, so this question is to uh, Dr. Babu. Hi, hi, Babu. Uh, so uh, I think uh, your presentation, you covered so many aspects uh, when I was trying to just assimilate my questions. I think every time your presentation came up, a slide came up, answered 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 so you you definitely covered almost everything i, I can say the same thing for everyone but uh, you touched upon a point uh, which uh, you also mentioned that 10 of the big companies have come together for the first time or maybe uh, for this cause of coming out starting a collaboration and uh, you also mentioned the activities which are taken up by ipa as part of a you know, collaboration to uh, look at uh, technologies and um, expertise within the country in india now, in this uh, entire process of uh, collaboration for these 10 companies uh, outside India, where do you think India fits in? And is there a possibility that uh, India can look at some backward integration, uh, especially in terms of uh, the, uh, the vaccines, uh, which uh, have been so much in demand now? And India stood up to uh, the requirement in terms of manufacturing with the collaboration room, uh, some big companies outside India but do you think that uh, India figures into this kind of a collaboration in the near future? Yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you, Rajiv, and nice to see you after a long time. And uh, yeah, it's a wonderful question. My thoughts, my personal thoughts on on this uh, aspect. So I think India has a great capability in uh, developing vaccine and even manufacturing. I mean, not just uh, Serum Institute or Bharat Biotech that we are hearing recently. Even years ago, when Shanta Biotech actually has developed Canbox, which actually was considered uh, by Sanofi as a good alternative to their, their vaccine. I think you know that actually is a testimony for the capability that India has got in developing and uh, manufacturing vaccines. Certainly, in fact, India can really, in fact, be one of the partners uh, for the other big, big time, big companies, uh, not just Serum Institute and Bharat Biotech, there are many companies that think they can really, uh, in fact, rise. And I, I'm sure, in fact, probably in the coming years, because manufacturing, uh, maybe capabilities and the supply chain, the challenges, the shortages are going to be much more as the, uh, the, the, the companies actually who have authorization for manufacturing and supply across the world, certainly there's going to be shortage. I'm sure in fact, the Indian industry can really explore opportunities to manufacture as one of the partners and really fill those uh, supply chain gaps. I'm sure in fact, no, that, that is there is a possibility and it's a matter of exploring and publicizing and convincing thank you so much uh, uh, the next question i would say is for dr jain uh, you also spoke about the uh, nitrosamine and i'm sure that uh, this is a big uh, discussion points uh, within the industry now all across the world and uh, every time we come across something new and uh, you know we, we talked about i think uh, you know one of your presentations said that you don't know how many more nitrosamine impurities are coming up. You already have six of them. And uh, you know, as, as uh, one of your presentations going on, suddenly on my mobile, you know, in the, on the social media, there was a flash of 
uh, you know, some guideline published, uh, I said, oh my God, there's another one coming up. So you keep on uh, hearing and uh, seeing these uh, guidelines getting published. Uh, and, and the first thing that we just scroll quickly is, is there a redu reduced uh, you know, specification in these uh, levels that we are talking about? I think the biggest challenge now is to analyze uh, our products and not only the products, we are going backwards, you know, the entire value chain of uh, the pharma manufacturing is all stirred up uh, to find out where does it originate and how can you reduce it. Uh, uh, the instruments which were earlier used in R&D have now started moving to the QC lab. Uh, as you mentioned about the LCMS, GCMS, which was never heard of as a conventional technique in the QC lab, have started moving in the laboratories. And uh, all the companies are geared up to handle the analysis uh, for their uh, processes. We have seen one after the other big products uh, being phased out, being uh, you know, removed from the market and they're not available. It started, uh, the entire uh, story started with Valsatan and it's uh, moving into so many other categories of products now. Uh, so the question that I want to ask uh, Dr. Jain is, uh, how do we handle uh, the analysis and especially uh, you know, when you spoke about uh, your uh, vendors who are your suppliers for the raw material, your packaging material, which uh, you know, do not have the capability and it's the onus on the manufacturer to understand uh, the input profile over there and also ensure that they are uh, under control so that the products that you make uh, do not bring in those impurities and do not pose a challenge for your uh, deliveries to the market. So is there something that uh, can be done with the help of uh, the regulatory agencies or uh, your pharmacopoeia to bring a methodology which can be really helpful for the industry rather than the uh, end user or end manufacturer trying to scramble for all the analysis that is required for such produce. So uh, thanks Rajiv. I think it's a very, very uh, pertinent question that, you know, the industry is facing. So I, how I look at it, that it's, it's evolving. But I see that I think uh, if I look at USFDA, currently what they have said that you compile everything by 31st of whatever marketing authorization you have in hand, compile everything by 31st of March. No need to submit. Keep it at your side. If we request, share it with us. So that is purely like every organization is doing this activity in their own manner. Like, you know, see, I cannot, there are, we, are, we are reaching out to all the vendors for excipient analysis, for packaging material, then from manufacturer of like various equipments and all. It's very difficult for us to say today that there will be, there can be a one single methodology with which we would be able to address the risk or no risk. So today we are relying on theoretical. How how, how are we conceptualizing that from API chemistry perspective, theoretical risk assessment, whether there are any nitrosation agent or not, then any recovered solvent is used or not. What is the probability of having a nitrosamine risk? Putting all other information together, like you know, vendors, we are doing internal assessment. We are reaching out to vendor to provide the declaration. Many of them are giving very extensive declarations. Some of the vendors are giving one page document also, and you cannot influence them. Likewise, from excipient manufacturer, collecting everything, collecting, collating, compiling, and keeping it side with the best possible, uh, like you know, conclusion that there is a risk or no risk. And when we see a risk, then definitely it has to be tested with the available method. Now, now Europe has published a general chapter. USP has published a general chapter. Methodology is there. Currently, we are dealing with all these chapters. But eventually, I see that I think that there is a possibility that there could be another method also, which is going to be introduced because of some or other element which may pose a risk. And we are evolving. So I think more and more information regulators are going to gather and then I think I see that there would be more, uh, like, you know, um, in terms of more impurities also and further improvement in methodology, which is going to be much more sensitive. Or there could be a possibility that there will be a clear cut indication that if you don't foresee a theoretical risk, there's no need to do it. Like testing, once you have a nitrosamine limit in general, like, you know, at when you see a th theoretical risk, do it in API at release and its stability demonstrate by like, you know, multiple data sets, map it, brand it, and then there is no need to do on regular basis. So I see a lot of scope over here, uh, Rajiv. This is how I look at it. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. 
Uh, one quick question to both uh, Dr. Babu and uh, Dr. Jain. We spoke about, uh, you know, now on this panel, you have, uh, you know, Vyati representing uh, agency, uh, Anthony representing uh, pharmacopoeia, both of you coming from industry. Another piece of, uh, you know, jigsaw is the government agency. Now, for both of you, I would ask, how, how uh, important is it to have a government uh, collaboration in the whole process of uh, product development and commercialization, uh, especially when you are looking at some of the most, uh, uh, you know, urgent requirements. I'm sure that they are involved in the, uh, you know, approvals of the products that we uh, manufacture. But what kind of, uh, uh, you know, collaboration do you expect from the government agencies uh, in the whole process in the pharma uh, uh, sector? Babu, you can take the question That's first. Fine. Okay, right. So partnership with the uh, government, actually, I'm, I'm sure you're referring to the government, not the regulators. Or I just want to make sure that I, you mean... Yeah, I would say, I would say so regulators are always with us, but in the policies which are made by the government are also uh, important for us to take our industry ahead. And, uh, you know, in the current times, when you're talking about so much of uh, you know, uncertainties around us, I think uh, the government partnership and also uh, the policies uh, make a lot of difference. Absolutely. I think you're right. In fact, you have half answered the question. Yeah, partnership with the government actually in the entire process is very important. Ultimately, what we are developing, we are manufacturing, if it doesn't reach the patient in need in a timely manner, I think our we're not serving the purpose. So it's uh, it's important to, in fact, take the government into confidence, maybe understand their expectations right at the start and, uh, and also work in alignment with that. That's important. So to avoid any disappointment at the end, sometimes of course there may be a special uh, requirement, special considerations to, in fact, ensure that our our medicines reach patients uh, much faster. So I think uh, also if you believe that, based on a science-based approach, if you believe that actually we can really request for some certain exemptions, make exceptions, I think it's better to uh, involve regulate the government agencies uh, at the start itself and work towards that. So that I think we all are working towards actually one uh, mission, mission, serving the patients. I think uh, I think that's very important to engage uh, policymakers and regulators very early, and also from time to time. Sure. So yes, Dr. Okay, Jain. Just to add on, yeah. So just to add on, Rajiv, I think I I think I've not seen any such platform very actively where, like you know, even even government of India, for example. They invite people from industry to put their views at which of the products where they see that they can put into the market first, like as a generic. And then what are the complexity involved in all developing those products? There are a lot of opportunities. Like, you know, nowadays you see that earlier, uh, five years, 10 years before, there were like number games in genetic space. And now there is on, like, you know, people don't want to, companies don't want to go for vanilla products. They want to go for niche products, complex products. I think there is a need to have a platform where like government can take, Ministry of Health can take initiative, invite industry and see to it that, you know, what, what their views are on those complex products, why it is taking so much of time to track those products, why there are no genetics. Still, there are many products where, are, where it is very difficult to develop a genetic product and you keep communicating with even with USFDA, you do a product development meeting, you do multiple correspondences also, but still you see that there, it takes a lot of time. I think the government should come out with such a platform where they invite industry, they invite expert, and they like, you know, it, it should be a very focused that these are the opportunities where we can make a mark. And then there should be a scientific discussion that how, and then the government and industry together, they I think they should interact with a USFDA or uh, for that matter, EMEA or any other market. I think those platforms should be created, what I believe. I I was coming to, yeah. to you yeah because I wanted to hear from you what kind of collaborations you have in your uh, yeah region. yeah please go ahead well actually it's my daily uh, bread and my daily job try to enter in this um, I mean to to keep the um, the contact with the um, with the let's say government in case of Europe it's obvious on the EU it's obviously the Europe, European Commission uh, as you know but we also have the network of the national authorities and EMA together so it's for me it is essential it is 
crucial to uh, for them to understand our needs and for us also to deliver on their needs. So I think uh, without this cooperation, we can't go further. And I fully recognize uh, what you, um, my colleague from Glenmark just said, simply because um, now where I see the weak point is a lack of understanding that um, the follow on innovation. So basically, um, all pharmaceutical forms now of the reference products are much more com complex. So the development of off patent sector is different than 20 years ago. And they need to understand that we need different uh, tools now, that we need different development programs, and we need a different perspective than it was uh, simply 20 years ago. So they, um, it's a shaping the, um, the, indeed, the scientific advice, the regulatory pathway, the global development, because obviously when we talk about follow-on orphan medicines or let's say pediatric medicines or uh, biosimilars, it's a different ball game and it's a yes. different investment which is needed. Without uh, understanding of this specificity, there will be no follow-on uh, affordable products on the market. This will not happen uh, just by miracle. Uh, so it needs to be a clear policy, holistic policy, to looking at all those um, elements together. And I think, um, you know, uh, watch this space because in Europe, the next five years will be really critical because uh, it's a huge, uh, we are uh, going through, we'll go through the huge revision of the pharmaceutical uh, policy strategy and also legislations uh, from the IP through um, basic pharmaceutical legislation reacting on on emergency etc so i think it will be really like a big constructive uh, big construction work uh, in europe for the next five years and obviously uh, our role in this case will be really to bring the messages what we need and shape the environment and try to indeed uh, optimize the framework for follow-on product um yes so it's clearly a must huh? Yeah, thank you so much, Anthony. Your thoughts? Uh, I think uh, you know you you would also have some uh, sort of a collaboration with the government, and uh, how does it help you in uh, the pharmacopoeial uh, compilation or uh, you know taking your uh, requirements uh, through with the government help? Yeah, thanks. I um, I, I think it's uh, I agree with everything that's that's been said. I would um, maybe. So the, the way the way we operate, sort of the whole the whole structure is about bringing industry and um, government and other stakeholders together in the standards development process. So it's sort of in the DNA that we hear those perspectives, but very specific in standards development. Um, what we've also done is sort of uh, our convention and convening power to um, our ability to bring stakeholders together to talk about some of these, some of these issues. Like we've created um, on a, a global coalition called the Medicines We Can Trust campaign, for instance, which is all about access to quality medicines in, um, in a, around the world, mostly focused in um, LMICs. But, we, we also engage in policy dialogues in, in the U.S. context, for instance, on Capitol Hill, where we talk about, um, we, we frame it as um, access to quality medicines, and now also talking about the supply of quality medicines to sort of put into broader context that the work and the funding of regulatory agencies, the imperative to work globally, is about their objectives, which is about patient access to medicines and better health care. So I think that part of it's important too, is to have the dialogue with governments and policymakers in a way that connects the important objectives that we know about to what they what they care about and what they're driven to do. And uh, you know, the, I think the other opportunity there for all of us is to engage in um, Kind of policy development to put ideas on paper, um, you know, to drive uh, to drive government um, dialogues and participate in them to share share the views of the scientific and the industry communities together. So it's essential. Thank you so much. You so uh, I think uh, great conversation. Uh, you have given your thoughts, and uh, I think the presentations that each one of you made. 
is going to be like a wealth of information for all the participants. I'm sure the participants definitely enjoyed your presentations and this conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. 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 Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye.